I rather overt racism than microaggressions. No, you wouldn't. Yes, I no, would. That's a because lie. then I know, I know, I I can understand like the dichotomy. I don't want to have that false sense of welcome or walk into a place where I feel like I'm safe and then I'm dealing with subtle racism and subtle racist jabs because when you react to subtle racism everybody treats you like you're crazy if you react to overt racism there are people that kind of understand but if you said 14 microaggressive things to me and i spaz out they're gonna be like what's the problem they didn't say anything that bad to you why are you so mad why are black people so angry what would you rather and welcome back to my channel this video is a little spur of the moment and it is not a fully fleshed out script so i apologize if it is a little rambly i was having trouble putting my thoughts into words on the page so i thought i would just try to hit some bullet points today and just things that i've been growing increasingly frustrated with in online spaces and that is my fellow white people and their attempts to acknowledge themselves as a white ally or somebody that is anti-racist but the moment that they receive any like mild sense of criticism from non-white people it's like all that performative activism just starts peeling away until there's nothing left but themselves the other white people that agree with them and the non-white people that they've tokenized for not disagreeing with them. And this is just something that happens with, I mean, it happens with all marginalized communities, but I do think it's important to draw attention to this specifically when it comes to marginalized people who are not white, because that's a pretty large group of fucking people. As a white person, it doesn't matter how queer you are or how disabled you are or how much trauma you carry, you can still be racist and I'll be honest, you probably are racist. I'm not saying that to make anyone feel like they're a terrible person. I'm saying that because you're a product of the society we live in, which is built on white supremacism. It's a lot easier to sit back and point the finger at everybody else, and even who you were in the past, to alleviate yourself of whatever guilt you, you may have in the present, of how you may have fallen short in some areas, or how there is still work to be done because there's always still work that you could be doing. And I'm not saying you have to dedicate the entirety of your free time into deconstructing your own whiteness. You have to survive. You have to put food on the table. You have to keep yourself healthy and hopefully happy. And you have every right to prioritize yourself and all of that. However, if you're online as a content creator and somebody is bringing something to your attention, how you respond matters. And it is of utmost significance if you can't manage to put in the work to reflect on the words that you say before you say them, especially when you have a platform. I do want to be forthcoming and saying that this video was inspired by some of the stuff that happened earlier this year between God is Grey and Joe Lumen because there's so much misinformation out there and things just not being accurately represented as to what the entirety of the situation was. I know God is Grey did make a video on it recently. I have not seen the entirety of that video yet. Um, I haven't found the patience as of yet, but I am going to put the links to everything that you might find useful in the description if you do want to look into that situation yourself. So I lied a little bit. I wasn't planning on going any further than that into what happened between God is Grey and Joe Lumen, but then I was getting screenshots for this video that was finished um, with about like 19 minutes long, including all my little voice recordings that I added in while I was editing. And I mean, I think I, I thought I was a pretty good video. Um, but then I got angry looking at the old screenshots I had from when I first found out about this around the time that it was happening, uh, which I think was when God is Grey first made an apology post on her Instagram and I was kind of confused and didn't know what she was talking about. And then I saw what was going on on Joe Lumen's Instagram and I was able to very quickly put two and two together because I followed both of them at the time and I just happened to be on Instagram at the time. And, you know, that got me a little bit angry, like reading over everything. 
And then I came across some Reddit posts. And then I came across this blog that I'm still in the middle of reading right now, which I highly recommend that at some point, if not now, later, you go take a look at it for yourself. Here's where I'm at right now before I let you guys get into the rest of the video. I will definitely, I shouldn't say definitely, I will most likely be making a response to God is Grey's recent video that was titled I was canceled. I haven't seen the entirety of it yet. I've only seen about five minutes. So we'll see how that goes. But the reason I decided to do that was upon looking at all the comments and just seeing how many people didn't even know she was canceled because she wasn't canceled. Okay, let's let's just be clear about that. She wasn't fucking canceled. I'm going to talk about that later in this video. So I'm not going to go on a rant right now. But that just it 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 irks me. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to put some screenshots on the screen, but you will need to pause to read it. I'm not going to go over everything because I genuinely want you to look into it yourself and how people were actually responding to this. Because the thing is, Brenda has said, from my understanding and from looking at the comments under her video, she's not giving any specifics about what happened. A lot of people that have any idea about what happened, the majority seem to just think it was about this picture of her and her friends in a post that was supposed to be promoting like diversity and like freedom and initially I'm sure you respond the way that I respond which is I'm like well she's just taking a picture with her friends like what's the harm in that there's a lot more context there to that but I just want to be clear the people that are angry at Brenda right now it is not just because of this in fact I don't even know if I would say that they were angry really about this because a lot of the comments criticizing this were very delicate and sugar-coated and not like mean uh, I mean, some of them were reactive, you know, people were reacting in their emotions, but a lot of them were like, wow, you guys are so pretty. I do wish that I saw more of this in the photo, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to get into the details again. I might put some screenshots up here. Pause and read for yourself. It wasn't the way that Brenda is describing it. And the thing is, is that's not the bigger picture of what happened. It's everything that happened after that Brenda seems to be glossing over, like, when she fell back to her friend Joe, who was defending her at the time, in order to tokenize her voice by saying that she's going to do a stream with her to talk about the issue. And then later on, Joe comes out saying that she felt really pressured to do that. And she didn't like the narrative that Brenda was pushing because Brenda was saying that this was a spontaneous photo. And Joe was saying, no, this was very much a planned thing that we were all invited to do. Joe as well, but she didn't feel comfortable with it. There was some more that was said. I don't have access to the videos that were originally posted and everything that Joe originally said, but I know it allegedly led to Brenda apparently wanting to take some form of legal action against her. That's the very mild basics of it. Oh, and one of the people in the photo named Alice posted a lovely response to the criticism. I am saying that very fucking sarcastically right now. That was completely riddled with racism and fat phobia. And Brenda had uh, nothing to say about that absolutely fucking nothing. I should also have probably just preface this by saying I'm a lot more angrier right now than I am throughout the rest of this video, especially after looking at the comments under Brenda's new video. So a couple other things I wanted to address real quickly. A couple weeks ago, Mickey Atkins did make a video talking about God is Grey and her perceived cancellation or what Brenda perceives as her cancellation. I have not seen that video, but I have read the comments under that video and I've read some of the comments under Brenda's video that was in response response to it. So just keep that in mind for what I'm about to say next. I am going to put up some screenshots of some comments. I'll put up a screenshot of the comment that Brenda left on Mickey's video and the comment that Mickey left. Something I do want to briefly address, briefly because I haven't actually seen the video yet, is I've seen a lot of comments criticizing Mickey for mocking Brenda's emotions. I think there was a point specifically where a comment might have made some mention in regards to Brenda crying in her car. And again, I don't know what Mickey's actual response to that was. I'm not a huge fan of policing people's behavioral responses. I understand that that can feel instinctual, but sometimes the face somebody's making or the tone somebody has isn't actually accurately representing what they're trying to convey. But more importantly, what I want to say is Mickey is not Brenda's therapist. It seems like there's this idea that because Mickey's a therapist that she's not allowed to mock anybody's emotions ever in any shape or form. And I'm not saying that that's something that's very kind to do, but I think 
think mocking does have a place in the sphere of the internet when we are responding and critiquing our fellow creators. That doesn't mean that it's kind, but I don't know that that necessarily always means that it's wrong either. And I don't think that Mickey being a therapist should really have any say in it because again, she's not Brenda's therapist. I know there was one comment that said that Mickey's reaction is exactly why they fear that when they go to a therapist that their feelings will be mocked as not being important. And I can see how that would be triggering, but sometimes our triggers are our own responsibility and we have to reflect on why we're feeling the way that we do and understand where that's coming from before putting the blame on somebody else. I talk about that a little bit on later in this video in regards to some other topics. And I think that might be the case here because again, Mickey Atkins is not Brenda's therapist. She doesn't have any like obligation to Brenda when it comes to behaving in a way that someone's therapist would behave. I mean, we are all individual human beings and we're allowed to take a step back from our profession. Another example would be, you know, I used to do volunteer work for recovering from religion. The way that I would talk to a client and even other volunteers as I was training them would be different than how I would talk about my feelings towards religion and on my own platform because this is my space to be able to express how I feel. It's not a space that is dedicated to the clients that I was speaking to through recovering from religion as they were struggling with their religious beliefs. And it's important that we still allow people to have their own space to express their feelings without having this obligation. That does not mean that I think Mickey did everything correctly because I don't know. I haven't seen the video and that opinion could change or grow as I do watch the video and react to it sometime in the future, hopefully in the near future. I also want to add, and this is something I have spoken about, even though what we're feeling may be valid, that doesn't mean that those feelings belong in that space at that time. And often when we see creators being mocked for feeling a certain type of way, it is because of the way that feeling is being utilized in the context of that video in comparison to what they're actually being criticized for. Which brings me to the final thing. I'm going to go ahead and let the video play through as I originally recorded it. At some point in the video, I am going to be addressing a comment that Brenda left in a reply to another commenter under her video. So if you're not watching the premiere right now, please stick around for that because although I don't know what I'm going to say yet, I'm guessing it will have some importance to the context of this video in its entirety. And I'll let past Brina take it away from here. I do want to speak generally and I think some of what I have to say applies to that situation. I find myself consistently baffled by how someone can just continuously make a situation worse and worse for themselves and still come out the other side believing that they had no fault, still blaming everybody else for the situation that they found themselves in. It's like when people claim that they were canceled while using the platform that they still have access to to talk about why they were canceled. And it's the language that they're using too, right? Because when you say I got canceled, you're saying something happened to you. That's the emphasis there. It's nothing that you did. It's just something that happened to you. And you're not even saying that you're the victim of circumstance. You're saying that you're the victim of some organized attempt or attack to cancel you as a person, as a human being, as a content creator, while still making content. I, I like, I don't, I don't get this. Why are so many like leftists falling for this ridiculous narrative? <laughs> Why do we think that we're so entitled for people to like us? or want to support us. More specifically, why do my fellow white people consistently think that they are entitled to non-white people's patience and forgiveness and empathy and support? Like, no, no, you're not. And that's not me saying that we as white people don't require or need a space to deconstruct our whiteness and our white privilege, but that does not mean that non-white people are obligated to provide that space for us. That falls back onto us. That is our responsibility. That is our baggage to unpack. Non-white people do not owe us a damn thing, okay? They don't need to sit around and wait for you to do better or be better. And they certainly don't owe you their trust that you will ever do better, let alone their forgiveness if and when you do. That's not their guilt to carry. That's our white guilt 
That's our shame. They don't need to be reminded that you're human or that we are human every time we inevitably fuck up and fall back on our white privilege and racial biases because they're not the ones that dehumanized you. You did and other white people did. Our ancestors did. And if you as a white person can't understand that, then maybe you're not the ally that you think you are. If you truly care about your audience and those that are marginalized in your audience or as a white person, those that are not white in your audience, why is your instinct to react and react and react and not just shut up for a second and reflect on what they're telling you? A lot of these white people are coming out of evangelical communities, right? Which is predominantly racist when you're fucking white. And I think... That's how it is for a lot of these leftist content creators. There seems to be this common similarity with all of us and that we came out of deeply racist, fundamentalist upbringings. And that's not true for everyone, but it's true for a lot of them because that kind of content is compelling to see somebody who has a similar experience to you and has successfully cut ties with their past and their upbringing. I'm using the term successfully very loosely here. But I also just want to take a moment to bring attention to the fact that I think there's also a deeply ingrained morality complex and a little bit of white savior complex that comes from growing up being taught how to be racist by your white guardians or family members or parental figures and coming out the other side of that and being able to acknowledge how deeply racist they were. The problem that arises in that is when that is your base level for what a racist is and what racism entails because then you've absolved yourself of any guilt or any acknowledgement of your own racism as a byproduct of that which can and does become an active choice when you are not actively and continuously striving to deconstruct that and any form of activism you partake in, which includes social and political commentary through an online platform. It's so easy to feel alienated and isolated in such a radical, fundamentalist, horrifically racist environment when you do not agree with those ideologies. But that's like surface level, right? Putting BLM or ACAB in your bio, which I'm guilty of that too, don't worry, and calling out the most obvious creators or journalists or media news actors for being racist, that's that's like, that's easy. That doesn't mean that you've done the work to deconstruct your own racism or your own white privilege. And I especially don't believe that you've done any of that if you still don't have the self-control to know when to stop talking, bare minimum when to stop talking, especially if you are striving to be an ally. And I think a part of being an ally isn't just listening to the people of that group that are agreeing with what you're saying. I would think that it would be um, pretty dehumanizing to see a creator fall back to one person's opinion as a reason that they were not in the wrong. Because this black person or this non-white person or this trans person or this disabled person agreed with me, so therefore I'm not wrong. Like that's that's a bit of a leap. How is that any different from the radical right-wing tokenizing black conservative voices? Regardless if your instinct is to disagree, regardless if not everything that every person said about you was correct, it is extremely dishonest and disingenuous to paint people criticizing you as some sort of malicious attack or attempt to cancel you. Even more so when the criticism is coming from somebody that you would call a friend or have considered a friend in the past, then that may be the time to reflect on your own part in that. If we're able to come together as a community of people leaving some radicalized ideology, if we're able to admit that we were once wrong in all these areas, why can't we admit that that could still be happening now? Why do we have to fall back on this emphasis of, well, I'm only human? Like, we already know that. So if you're human, then allow yourself to be human. Allow yourself to be wrong. I think this goes back to that morality complex and white savior complex and even a little bit of a God complex that I was talking about earlier. Public figures and people that are in some type of celebrity sphere or people with an online platform tend to act like it was 
was their fan base that placed this God complex on them or this idea that they have to be perfect. But did the fans build that perception of them? Or was that instilled from the person that they idolized, refusing to ever take accountability, responsibility, or even acknowledge the faults that they themselves are uncomfortable acknowledging? Because being wrong in the way of bigotry is not fucking comfortable. So how do we get more comfortable acknowledging it if the people that we idolize and look up to are too good to do it for themselves? And it like all comes back to the moral panic or fear mongering of being canceled. And it's entirely fucking fabricated. I'm not saying that there aren't specific instances of threats or dangers that can come from being openly criticized by the public. But the select few don't speak for the majority, and that's a situation to be handled individually, not to be weaponized against the entirety of the criticism that you're facing in any case. I just really wish more people allowed themselves the space to reflect and consider more before going on the defense and reacting online as if they are a wounded animal backed into a corner. It's okay to feel your feelings and I genuinely believe that because I I don't think most people really have control over that but I think what's not okay is expecting everyone else to do the emotional labor to deconstruct why you're feeling the way that you are. I had a really good conversation with my partner recently when we were talking about the phrase I hate men directed at cis men because I'm not going to sit here and pretend that trans men hold any power over cis men or the patriarchy. I know my partner initially found that offensive and I remember discussing and breaking down why he found it offensive and he took some time to reflect on it but then he came back and he said you know I do identify closely with my gender with being a man and he said that he thinks in the society that we live in it's not really possible to be a man and not question yourself in the places that you have fallen short and contributed to the patriarchy in some way or toxic masculinity. Despite him knowing that he's against all those things, there's also a part of him that is deeply aware that he is still a product of those things. So when he hears the phrase, I hate men, he's not just hearing, I hate the patriarchy. He's asking himself, could he be in the category of men that should be hated? And the reason I'm able to look at that and have empathy and love for him is because he wasn't weaponizing those feelings, that reactive emotion against me. He was reflecting and deconstructing what it was that made him feel that way and acknowledging that it's not the phrase I hate men that made him uncomfortable. It's not comfortable to be able to look in the mirror and ask yourself what you're capable of and acknowledge what you could be capable of. But when all is said and done, what matters most is not what we're capable of. It's what we choose to do with that. And we're always able to choose different. The reason I am bringing up this story in this video is because similarly to how cis men can be made uncomfortable when they are confronted with the knowledge that not only is the patriarchy oppressive against non-cis men, it is also uncomfortable for white people to acknowledge how they may have contributed to racist behaviors and upheld white supremacism through racial biases and they're taking advantage of white privilege if only when it suits them because it means acknowledging that they still need to actively deconstruct the racism that is deeply ingrained within them. Within all of us and it's not as simple as merely acknowledging that you're a product of racism and that you have racial biases it is a matter of actually looking at specific actions and behaviors that you are presently participating in which can sometimes reflect how we react when we are directly confronted with our own problematic behavior and developing the ability to be emotionally aware enough to question yourself and ask yourself why you are feeling the way that you are and reflecting on that before reacting in defense takes a hell of a lot emotional labor 
and work. And that is ongoing. It doesn't stop. It can't possibly in a society built on white supremacism. But unfortunately, it seems like we have this huge impasse when it comes to the moral panic and fear mongering of cancel culture as a phenomenon that the way I see it d doesn't actually exist at all. It exists as an idea. Um, I don't know that I've ever actually seen it play out in reality. <laughs> I don't even know what that would what that would look like, to be honest. But I have to think that if you have the self-awareness to look back at a time where you were so sure of yourself, you were so sure that you were right, that you were the good guy, and you can look back at that time and say, no, I was wrong. In fact, I was the bad guy. Then maybe be less sure next time. Maybe your instincts are wrong. Maybe your feelings are valid and you have a right to have the space to feel those feelings, but maybe it's your responsibility to put in the emotional labor to understand why you are feeling the way you are feeling rather than put the blame and the responsibility on everybody else to educate you, to convince you to do better when you should already know that you can do better. I know our instinct is to be the victim and to even feel like the victim, but that doesn't mean that it's always justified. It doesn't. And if you can't acknowledge that as a social or political commentator or just a public figure with a platform, you're going to crash and burn repeatedly in slow motion over and over and over again. And metaphorically speaking, wouldn't it be easier to just get off the train and stop the cycle and just walk to the place that you're trying to get to and I'm I'm so done with this metaphor now but you you get what I'm saying right yes you are human so be human be wrong and be wrong again be wrong I don't care how many times allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to admit that you don't know everything and that you're not perfect not in the matter of saying I'm not perfect but in the manner of actually saying this is where I fucked up people don't want to hear that you're not perfect they already know that okay so as promised I want to um, respond to a comment that Brenda left on her video addressing all of this sort of I don't really know I haven't seen it yet um, that I will hopefully be reacting or responding to sometime soon the original commenter had said on the one hand I agree that the way we cancel people can be harmful it's not so much consequences as it's a bunch of people dogpiling without doing any research on the other hand I have seen so many instances of creators being all oh I'm being canceled when people are actually saying hey this is a part of a pattern that the person is shown. I see a lot of that start as non-white fans or creators trying to point out an issue and it getting out of hand. I don't know if that's how you meant for this to come across, but it kind of seems like you're saying that cancellation is all mean girl shit because people are jealous when very often what is happening is that people from marginalized communities are finally speaking up about harmful behavior from a creator or community. Sadly, it works best against smaller creators, especially women of color. I've seen this time and time again. Meanwhile, bigger creators can be truly bigoted and they still have a platform. I also find it interesting, even though I haven't seen the video yet, that this person is saying that it seems like Brenda is saying that all cancel culture is mean girl shit because people are jealous. I guess I'm just like curious about that because her friend that was in the photo named Alice was criticized for claiming that fat people were just jealous of the photo. Um, there was a lot of other racist and fat phobic rhetoric laid in that. Again, there will be links in the description so that you can see that for yourself. So I find it... <laughs> I find it um, upsetting that that would be how Brenda is coming across. It just seems to be reinforcing some of what Alice had already said, and that's extremely concerning to me. I do think, in my experience, when I see people claiming that they've been canceled, especially when they're claiming that they're being canceled by a marginalized community, it just always seems to me like a complete inability to reflect before you respond and the situation just gets way out of hand from there. Because as I said earlier, the comments that were originally left under the pick that sort of kicked off all of this were overall pretty mild and even overtly polite, I would say. But I think what happens is when you're getting a lot of those comments and you're getting the notifications and you're seeing that 
it feels like an attack. It feels like you're being dogpiled because a lot of people are thinking the same thing. But just because a lot of people are thinking the same thing, that doesn't actually mean that you're under attack. People are reacting for a reason. And I think if you are a creator who is promoting your content um, for a profit, um, which includes your other social medias, especially a picture that also seems to have a product placement in it, I think you're kind of obligated to sort of respond and to know how to not respond in such a way that's going to villainize the people in your audience who had that reaction. What I found most interesting, though, was Brenda's response to this, which was, I can talk about this further, but my particular experience was led by a large majority of white women supposedly speaking on behalf of non-white people, while non-white people DM'd me to say that they disagreed with the backlash, but didn't want to get involved. Also, my in real life non-white or BIPOC friends walked me through the experience and at least one said white women have lost their damn minds. Of course, my cancellation wasn't exclusively white women, but they represented the vast majority. So I can really only speak to how white women treat each other and ironically silent non-white or BIPOC voices while centering themselves in these pylons. One major issue I see is that white women often treat BIPOC people as though they are a monolith. <laughs> I'm laughing because although I agree with that statement, it just, it seems very ironic to me coming from Brenda right now. And we'll share the same views on how social justice needs to play out when in fact, obviously, no person is a part of a monolith and not all BIPOC people think the same. Again, obviously. I'm just like kind of baffled by this response um, because of the events that took place when all of this went down. First off, a lot of this really escalated and got out of control when the a person in the photo who is Brenda's friend Alice responded to some of the backlash with a lot of fat phobic and racist rhetoric rhetoric sprinkled in there and then Brenda was silent on it but also when she encouraged Joe to go on a live stream with her to respond to the criticisms that she was receiving and then Joe later said that she felt uncomfortable and she felt pressure to do that she didn't like the narrative that Brenda was pushing because Brenda kept repeating that this was a spontaneous photo when Joe was saying that this was very much a planned thing. It was something that everyone knew about, that everyone was asked to, to participate in. And yeah, like naturally as somebody who doesn't have a big platform or somebody who doesn't make any profit off of putting content out there, you can see how if you're just taking a picture with your friends and you're trying to uplift yourselves and each other, like what's the harm in that if it's not a diverse photo? Like why does that matter? But you have to put it in the context of Brenda is a content creator. She does make a, probably a decent profit off of her content. She has a decent sized platform. And it also appears like there's a product placement in the photo. I'm not saying that's for certain, but that's how it seems. And if it was also a planned event, then yeah, you know, you get into more understanding of why people feel justified in criticizing this in the context of the caption that was left, not the photo itself, but what what was said in the caption. I mean, it's not, that's not a spontaneous photo then. So if we are to believe Joe, then and it seems suspicious to me if Brenda was purposefully misleading or lying about the circumstances that led to that photo being taken. Another issue is the comment about treating non-white people as though they are a monolith. I just find it interesting because in the paragraph right before that, Brenda is sure to point out that BIPOC people were DMing her and saying that they disagreed with the backlash. So I'm like, aren't you trying to justify your behavior by pretending that they are a monolith because you're like, sure to mention, oh, hey, it was mostly white people criticizing me. And also non-white people did DM me saying this, duh, there's going to be black people or indigenous people or other ethnic minorities that are going to think this isn't a big deal. I don't understand why you're getting the criticism. That doesn't erase the people that you are being criticized from, which Brenda acknowledges here. Some of them were BIPOC or non-white people. I would think that Brenda should have the knowledge or, you know, the integrity and the accountability to herself to be able to explain explain or understand why she feels that she was justified in her behavior without falling back to that or why she feels like she could have done better in the situation again without falling back to that because uplifting the voices that agree with you while putting down those who are not white and don't agree with you is kind of speaking over those voices if you don't try to understand the perspective of the people that are criticizing you how can you actually know that you're correct or that you are justified it seems like an easy way out to not have to do any of the work to really understand the criticism and where it's coming from. As far as the vast majority being white people, I don't know how true that is. I don't know how Brenda would have 
assessed that situation and decided that. Obviously, Joe used to be friends with her and she is not white. And she was a big creator that was criticizing her about this issue. But then also the blog that I referenced earlier that I do recommend you read was written by a white person and they do acknowledge that. If we fall back to this narrative that white people should be silent in the face of their fellow white people displaying problematic behaviors in regards to racism, then I think we're failing to hold ourselves and each other accountable in that way. And also inadvertently placing all of that work on non-white people. In my own efforts to decon construct all of that when it comes to my privilege and my whiteness. I think specifically when we're talking about ex-evangelical spaces, and in my case, ex-evangelical and atheist skeptic spaces, we should, for all intents and purposes, be able to have more self-awareness than what the majority of the large voices in the community seem to have, simply because we've been able to look back at a time when we were so sure that we had all the answers and to realize that we didn't know shit. There was a time when I definitely was very arrogant and cocky in my atheism and angry, of course. Um, and in a lot of cases, rightfully angry. I was rightfully angry at the church. I was rightfully angry at my family. I was rightfully angry at society in general for the way that religion has been used and abused as a tool to control the masses and manipulate people and just harm so many people. But in that ignorance, I also failed to acknowledge the history of white supremacism when it comes to Christianity as a whole and how the way I'm speaking about a topic could also be inadvertently pushing that. Because as white Christians attempted to whitewash other cultures, they did the same with their religion as religion is a part of their culture. They did this by rebranding holidays that were not initially Christian holidays. They did this in the form of of propping themselves up as white saviors as they go to these non-westernized regions and countries to provide needed essentials and life-saving medical supplies or treatment or food to people in need, but they just have to agree to let them try to convert them to Christianity first. And I, I can see now looking back as, you know, a white atheist, how there is sort of this ignorance in the way that some of us have talked about or are talking about issues that isn't nearly enough aware of the history with that and how the way that they speak about supernatural beliefs could almost be sort of bouncing off of that white supremacism in such a way where you're also potentially erasing and invalidating somebody's history and their traditions that may be tied to religion. Like there's a way to not believe what other people are believing in terms of supernatural claims without being bigoted. Don't forget to check out the links in the description box and I encourage everyone to continue the discussions that are being had here in my comment section. That was a huge ramble and if you're watching this video, I must have found something redeemable in it. So I guess thanks for sticking around and I hope it was worth it. I'm sorry if it wasn't. Eventually I'd like to come back and maybe do a more concise, well thought out video, but I really wanted to put my thoughts out there and my brain has just not been working as well this week in terms of trying to take any of these words and actually put them on a page coherently. So I hope my talking did it somewhat justice. Until next time, take care. Stay safe, and I will catch you in the next one. Special voice shout out to my top patrons, Birdie, Laura A, and Sarah Z.